Okay, let's see if this works any better. I'm just jumping back in to the chat. Do we have any chat? Oh, okay, Newt, thank you for confirming. Functionality, how are we sounding? Is that any better? Any worse? How is it? Okay, it looks like uh, it seems to be working. Working again. Let me just adjust a little bit. Really trying to make sure that it's uh, doing what it needs to do. Hmm. Okay, there we go. A little skippy, but better. Okay, as long as it's better, that's good. And we're getting people back in. I'm really sorry that that kind of fried on us, but uh, what can you do? Not a whole lot. Um, okay, I, but we get people back in, so thank you for joining in again. And Pi Dreadhawk, glad you caught alive. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. And Crystal's back too. A lot of people back pretty fast, so I really appreciate that. And I'm glad it is working better. So where were we before? We were talking about, um, I think Curtis's is uh, Daphnia culture, a couple of things like that. So, so yeah, I appreciate everyone's patience on this and hopefully you can still hear me because I've got a snake on the microphone. So hopefully this is working. And okay, Quermax, purchase one of the species, one offspring, if they successfully breed from you. I will look into getting permits from those if I get them to breed. And if so, then yes, we'll make it work. But I don't have a permit to sell them yet. Hey, Ray's in the house. Nice to see you in. Erosma, hey -o. Austin C, hello. Daphnia feeding. Is it possible to feed Daphnia with crushed fish pellets? Should I mix it with water to create a soup? Thanks in advance. A couple of different ways you can approach that. What I do a lot of the time these days with uh, my Daphnia culture and this, I learned from Adam uh, at the, um, it's the Phoenix Aquatics, what, is, what do they call it? can't remember the exact name, but it's a high school that has a, basically a marine biology program, and um, I've helped them get some live food cultures going. What they found that worked for their Daphne that was really nice was the, um, they used the Aquion algae chips and just dropped them in the culture and just let them sit there, and it worked well for them. 20 gallon tank with scuds and daphnia in it as I throw the, uh, you know, an, one of those algae chips in there. The scuds eat it and as they do they kind of make a mess and particles, really small particles end up being suspended in the water and the daphnia eat that. So that's one of my favorite foods to give them, honestly, because it's really easy. It's something I've, it's a fairly new thing that I've been doing, but it works. So to answer your question, yes, it is possible to do that. And you could crush it with water, create a soup and just feed lightly, especially if it's a new culture. If you've got a larger culture, and you've got snails or amphipods or something there especially, but even if you don't probably, you could just throw one in and as it dissolves, um, that will provide some food for them. So yes, it is possible. Uh, ah, Toilet Pete, glad to hear the springtail culture is going well. And I'm glad my video was helpful. And Forest Oasis, oh, your Vernal Pool Aquarium water. That does happen a lot with Vernal Pool Aquarium. You know, the tannins that form by the, because of the uh, various things that are in there. Um, the can be compost and the water from the foods that are being fed. Not an uncommon thing. Ah, yes, Newt, I do remember about your blue death fanning beetle with the black patch. And glad it's back. You know, speaking of blue death fanning beetles, my uh, captive bred blue death fanning beetle has um, sort of re... Um, it, not re, but it's sort of... Basically, it's the adult color. It might be a little bit darker than the others, but not much. It's pretty much there. So I'm pretty excited about that to have the captive bred one doing what it should be doing and getting the color that it should be getting. And Therapod Hunter. Actually, we're going to have a reptile show. And Ray, I was going to get back to you on that. I realized I didn't. I didn't mean to not get back to you on that. Um, I talked to you a little bit about it, but I didn't really. So I need to get back to you on that if you're still in the chat. Um, yeah, oh, you can hear the rooster. I was going to ask you if you can hear the rooster. Yep, we've got, uh, we've got chickens. We don't have a rooster, but our neighbor has a, a rooster, and uh, he's, uh, I, it's, it's awesome, I think. Um, we don't, it doesn't bother us, and uh, he shares eggs with us, which is awesome. He's a really nice guy, and I'm really glad to have him as a neighbor, and uh, the roosters are just a fun perk. <laughs> 
So Heather Jensen, that is fun that your cats, um, <laughs> cats actually like the algae chips. I guess it's because it has fish meal in it, huh? Can you make a video on breeding bloodworms? Well, let me tell you, William, this is a popular request, but my experience with bloodworms is that for the energy and time that go into raising bloodworms, you can raise a huge amount of something else, whether that be grindle worms or you know, something with a similar environment would be say Daphnia or uh, mosquito larvae. You can produce a huge number of mosquito larvae, or a huge number of Daphnia for the same time and effort that you can to do bloodworms. I've done bloodworms before, mainly by accident. You put a culture container outside, like for Daphnia, with aeration, some light aeration. If you leave it there long enough, it may eventually be populated by bloodworms, but there aren't very many of them. I'm kind of thinking that they do better in really large bodies of water uh, in terms of producing them in large quantities. Obviously, they're profitable to harvest in large quantities, but they're not being farmed as far as I'm aware. They're being collected in the wild and, you know, sustainably harvested, I would hope. But um, just the fact that when I'm harvesting them from a small container where they just kind of show up when I'm trying to actually raise Daphnia, there's hardly any. You get like 20 or 30 of them for the, you know, 400 Daphnia that you're producing, something like that. So that's why I don't do it. Formal top hat. That is a good question. Never had a pet I regret um, getting. You know, the scenario is familiar. I think, I think that has happened. It feels, I feel like that's happened. But just right now thinking on my feet, I'll have to give it a minute. Oh, and Maxwell, you're coming back too. Excellent. And Bug Slayer. Oh, you did get some desert beetles from Bugs in Cyberspace. Awesome. He's got some great stuff. And Sea of Forest Oasis, thanks for joining in. They killed Joel, got a baby snapping turtle, and he won't eat any advice. He won't eat pellets or earthworms. Hmm. You might want to try something swimming to get the baby snapping turtle's attention. Something that swims well. I mean, the worms are going to be moving probably to some degree. Um, also, just check uh, temperatures, make sure he's getting the... And the formal top hat. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, and you're very welcome. Um, I'm glad that it does help you decide exactly what is a good pet for you and entertains. That's good balance. I like that. Greetings, Kermit the Hermit Crab. How are the other death feigning beetles doing any other adults yet? I do not have any other adults that have been captive bred yet. I've got lots of larvae, but no other adults, and I think I know why. In retrospect, you know, analyzing the situation. Because I went back to the incubator after I collected that one and looked in there, and I found that the one that had a a tunnel, or the remains of a tunnel out of the substrate, was the one I had put it there, put in there in May. May 15th is what the label said. And um, so May 15th, and it hatched on July 21st. It, you know, finished pupating and, and exited as an adult uh, in July 21st. So I figured these other ones, why aren't they pupating and went and dug through the substrate, did not find uh, any. I found one, something that may or may not have been the remnants of a larva, but I feel like what happened is because one day I totally overdid it on the humidity, and I think what probably happened at that point, and this was before May 15th, I overdid it on the humidity and kind of screwed that up, and that probably killed the other ones. But um, at least now I know that. Um, so I'm hoping that now that I'm, I've got much, a much better handle on regulating humidity in a container like that, that I will uh, have a lot more luck. So now I have one fairly large larva that's about to go in, and about nine larvae that I took out recently and are growing it's fairly fast, last time I checked. And uh, I'll put those in as soon as they're ready to go in. So, oh, Ray got a ground floor table. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely need to talk. Um, I need to talk to my wife about it first and see what's going on, but... Uh, Sounds fun. I, I, I'm missing reptile shows, I was going to tell you that. Um, okay, well, Cloud 9.5, totally get it. Priorities, got to do it. And thanks for getting a life spike going and a like spike going. Wally's back, excellent. Pocosaurus, hello. And Tiger Centipede's back out of the dirt. 12 weeks, Mr. Efin. Perhaps it was molting. That's awesome that it's back. 
They do tend to do that once in a while, even if they're not molting. I've had them do that molting. It's hard to tell though when they molt or not because I, I understand they eat their never found a, well, I can't say I've never seen a molt, but I don't see them often. Um, and Heather Jensen, good question. I actually appreciate toads a lot. Them in too. And I'm not sure why that is. Because I think they have a lot of personality. I've enjoyed the toads that I've kept, so I hope they get more. It's certainly cool, and they seem like they're kind of popular. Oh, and I totally missed that question, Wally, so let's do it. Top three live foods you would start for freshwater fish, three to four inches. Um, so small fish. Mm, Daphnia, definitely. Scuds and grindleworms. Those are my three just off the top of my head. Based on the acceptance level of the fish, benefits to the fish, size um, range that you mentioned there, and uh, production. Did I already say production? But grindleworms are super easy, produce like crazy, are really good for fattening fish up or getting um, conditioning going. Daphne, the same thing. And scuds are super easy. Daphne are probably the hardest one out of all those to get going if you've never done it before, but once you get them going, you're golden. So um, those would be it. I think so. Um, there'd probably be some other options that are close, close there, but I would do those. They're not necessarily entirely the easiest ones. And there are some other ones that I would do too for fish that size, but those would be my top three. That, and that's partly probably just based on personal preference. Theropod hunter, black beauty stick insects. I don't think I've ever heard of that one, but it sounds pretty cool. William Horn, your African giant millipede, really active. Hmm. Well, just check husbandry, make sure temperature's fine, humidity's fine, and everything. That's not common for millipedes to just suddenly act like that. But make sure everything husbandry-wise is okay, just in case. But, uh, yeah, probably not a necessarily, a, it's not necessarily a bad sign that that's what it's doing. So, formal top hat. Ah, you like the velvet ants, too. Good. More insects to that community. I might. There are now eight velvet ants in that enclosure. And uh, one of them I've had for over a year. I don't think uh, I will add more velvet ants to that enclosure because in a 5.5 footprint as a 10 gun, I don't know that I would add any more velvet ants. Maybe one or two. But uh, I might add a few more beetles because there are only four in there right now. I have two Eliodes. Um, Obscurus, two, one Eliotis hispilabris, and then a Cryptoglossum morricata, and they're awesome. And uh, but I think I could probably put a few more beetles in there without a problem. So I might just I'd probably either do a different species or get a more individuals of the species that I have. I guess those are my choices anyway. So so I heard that firebelly toads are a little less common in the hobby now because of chytrid. Is that true? Anybody know about that? Cane toads, you can't buy in my state. I have a lot of experience seeing them in the wild. When I was in Hawaii, they're a huge feral population there. I loved seeing them all the time, but uh, I, I haven't kept one as a pet. Asian forest scorpion or tailless whip scorpion? Hmm. Both pretty cool. I have both. I guess it kind of depends. Asian forest scorpion is going to like a to hang out with in general, and uh, it's going to be easier to handle your What's going on with the chat? Is it gone again? Holy cow. Everybody please, uh... Oh, it's back! That's awesome. What happened before? That's so weird. I thought it would, was happening again. Um, so yeah, there's some ideas, I guess. Um, I have both and I like them both. I can't really decide which one is cooler. Tail is whips are easier to handle, but also pretty shy. And Asian forest scorpions are maybe more aggressive with their food, so maybe that'll give you some ideas. And Francis, thank you. Malaysian Malayan box turtles, plenty of building upon with koi. Wondering if they'd go after the fish or leave them alone if they can't fit in their mouth. Um, my guess is if they're large enough so that they, look, you know, they're bigger, much bigger than the turtles themselves, they probably will leave them alone. But I haven't worked with Mal Malayan box turtles at all. So ah, Salvo, nice to see you. Been a while, but welcome. Um, oh, Crystal, yeah, the African clawed frogs are cool. And Fire Eel, William. I, I know of them. I've never kept one, so I don't feel like I have a lot of information I can give you about a Fire Eel, but they're cool. 
And crystals, pets, and plants are fun. I've kept a couple different kinds, I guess. Plants for the wall of a waterfall that you're building. I, the first thing that comes to my mind besides mosses is uh, a liverwort. Some, liver, some of the liverworts do really well in a situation like that, right up against the waterfall. I had some liverworts grow right on the, the uh, outtake of my goldfish filter where the goldfish couldn't get to it because it was you know, up higher. They grew right there, so it looked like a waterfall of liverworts. It was really cool, actually. Um, that would be one. And Tony Altobello, Velvet Ants are native here, and I have a container with four different kinds, six individuals. Cool. It's cool, kind of similar to mine. I have, uh, there are several species native to my state. Um, I think two of the species I have are native to my state, and two of the species are not. But they're very cool. If I ever had a wolf spider, I have not. I've only really kept uh, jumping spiders, a couple different species of those. And I haven't tried breeding hornworms yet. But I'm interested in especially trying silkworms. And if you could choose a rodent pet, which species would you prefer? Salvo says, okay. Well, I have kept mice, I've kept rats, I've kept gerbils, and I've kept golden hamsters. And out of all of those, uh, rats are definitely my favorite because they're so personable. They're like little dogs. That would definitely be the one that I'd choose to keep again. Um... Oh, so it's missing some legs, William. Well, hopefully in the next melt, it'll get some legs back. Oh, emerald green toad. Hmm, I, I saw one of those when I was in Italy, I believe. They have an emerald green toad, if that's the same species you're talking about. They were very cool. And Austin, I, I feel you. I know what it's like when you can't quite get what you want uh, because of the situation you're in. Um, huh. So Pi Dreadhawk with the, the camel spider, that's cool that it's eating for you at all. Um, the couple of camel spiders I've tried to keep don't seem very interested in food. But if you're getting them to eat the pupae from your millworm colony, I mean, that's, that's awesome. I don't think that's an inappropriate food it's, if they're eating them. Shoot. We, we disappeared for a minute, but I think we're back. We're back. Sorry about that, everybody. Lost you for a minute. Um, so any other insects that would go well with the velvet feigning beetle community? Well, just about any deserty darkling beetle and some other darkling beetles that aren't really death feigners uh, or really desert beetles. There's, some of them are fairly drought tolerant and could do okay. Like some people have kept mealworm beetles in a situation like that. If you just want a variety of sizes and so on, you could do that. Um, but I really hope so because my clock is ticking. So if you can hear me, please uh, let me know. Give me, a, give me some ch Okay, everybody, we're gonna try this. I'm just gonna bring it into the house. Woo, sorry. Everything's flipping around. And see if bringing it in the house does any better. Okay, sorry, you gotta look at the ceiling for a second here. Coming into the room. And we'll sit down, see if that makes any difference. Oh. Woo, where are you going, buddy? Too dark in here. Okay, are we back? We're back? Okay. We're back. So let me readjust slightly. And you get an excellent view of my Pellia plants in the background. A little bit dark in the back in this room compared to outside, I guess. But we'll go with it. Okay. Cool. Maybe that's all it was. We just had some kind of a bad connection and that seems to have helped. So we'll go a couple more minutes, huh? We can go a little while longer. <laughs> so, yeah, my, uh, my internet might be better in the house. So, formal topic, would you get a rose hair tarantula? Um, no, because my wife has asked me not to get any tarantulas at all, ever. And I just have to respect that. Um, so that's how it goes, I guess. That's what you got to do. You know, I wanted to mention an interesting thing. I'm going to, yeah, trees eat in the internet. 
I'm going to try feeding this guy a very, very small chicken egg because my neighbor, like I said, he gives us eggs. We got some very, very small chicken eggs and birds' eggs are a natural food item for a lot of colubrids that get, you know, encounter them in the wild and it's much, much smaller than a normal chicken egg. So, um, we'll see what we get. And let's see. Um, so, Heather, the Cebu Blue Pothos, that's the one that I think, um, I think that's the name of the one you sent me that I've got rooted in my goldfish tank and it's grown it's probably somewhere like five feet long now so i think that is the one and it's a really cool plant i really like it so yeah this is this is mr skeletal my son's corn snake he last time we weighed him oh it's time to weigh him again it was over 500 grams and we, when we got him he was about 50 so he's a fun fun snake we watched him kind of grow up um So, yeah, she's okay with uh, jumping spiders like the guys you see back over here. Totally fine with that. Not really tarantulas. Um, and thank you, Crystal. Well, she she wasn't all that excited about a giant centipede at first. She wanted some assurances that it would uh, not get out. And so we made sure we had a very um, good enclosure for it. Uh, and it never did get out, never did escape. It lived, lived with us for three or four years. So, um, yeah, it, it was uh, it was easier to do the, the centipede. Um, oh, cool. So I'm, I'll look forward to that growing some splits. That would be cool. And then, um, let's see. Oh, the kids are doing fine. I actually have two sons and two daughters. And they're, they're doing well. Um, except for one daughter's a little under the weather right now. I don't think it's anything super scary, but... She just woke up and didn't feel all that well today. But other than that, everybody's doing well. They're uh, surviving this weird version of school that we're having, the hybrid school. And formal top hat, have you ever had a pet escape? Indeed, I have. When I was a kid, um, I don't have it happen very often these days, although occasionally something happens. But um, one of my velvet ants got out. That's the most recent escape I can think of, and that was maybe six, eight months ago. I think someone took the lid off and... Uh, when they did, they sort of, it sort of flicked off because it was on the underside of the lid. That's my guess. Um, and, oh, Jordan, what was my es my escapee last Wednesday? I don't remember what it was. Oh, was it this guy? When he crawled onto the, the, um, the aquarium frame? That was actually really fast. That's the one I'm remembering anyway. But yeah, when I was a kid, I had my hamsters escape. I had... Snakes escape because I didn't have excellent snake enclosures. Things like that happened quite a bit. And the formal top hat. Do you have any other pets on the way? Well, at the moment, as in in the mail, I don't. I'm sure I'm going to be getting more in the future. I do have a reveal of some that got here. And I haven't released the, uh, the reveal video yet, but I will. So that's coming soon. And Kermit. Yes, I'd like to check that out. <laughs> Young lad, yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, the entangled snake, Jordan. Yep, got him out really fast, actually. Uh, and Houdini, oh, that there you go, Heather. Our, our, the snake that escaped when I first got my snakes from the enclosure. Um, the first got the garter snakes. One of them escaped because the enclosure was wet, so it could crawl right up the wall and was able to squeeze through the gap in the lid. So I immediately moved them to a, an escape-proof enclosure as soon as possible. Well, not immediately, as soon as I got one, which was a couple of days. And uh, then after that, no more escapes. But I did have Houdini get out at that point. Um, so it was kind of uh, kind of tricky, I guess. But uh, we averted that disaster. And now when the baby garter snakes are born, I will be putting them in uh, the kind of enclosure that I had them in. Uh, that I moved the other ones into, which is pretty escape-proof. It's got a gasket seal on it. I don't think we have to worry about it. Uh, the baby snake's getting out. Welcome, Frank. How do you say that? Frank de Tank? I like that. Where are you going, buddy? Oh, you're going to knock something over. Oh, let's not do that. He almost knocked the uh, jumping spider. Somebody asked, I, I missed it, but if the jumping spiders have names. This one is Padme. My wife suggested that name because she's got some intricate, kind of an intricate paint job, I guess. And this little one, this is a, an Audax. The other one's a Regius. 
Oedipus Regis. This is an Audax. Does not have a name. Got it pretty recently. Probably will name it eventually. But... Um, let's see. Formal top hat? Mm, neither, actually. Neither reptile nor insect. So, maybe that'll uh, help. Let's see. So, MN, the only snake you like is corn snakes or garter snakes? Um, I love the Trogloderis. They looked really cool. I might. I don't know. I have to check and see if I can get them. But if I could, I would love some. Uh, okay. Lots of time on my hand. So, Pi Dreadhawk might just go camping here soon. Good time of year to make your way down to the desert to look for blue death fanny beetles. Well, I don't have a lot of experience finding them in the wild. The last time I did was also the first time I did. So, um, I would say, though... They are generally not active in the winter at all, uh, even though it might be warm enough for them to be active. They, they tend to bury themselves um, in that period of time and not really come out a lot. So maybe around May or so is my, when you'll be able to see some. I saw one in June this um, spring in the morning. It was about 7.45 or 8 o'clock in the morning, I think. So you either want to go in the evening or the morning to see them more. Uh, and yeah, that's that's only the, the only advice I really have on that because I haven't found very many. So Supreme Gecko, are you surviving the cricket mealworm shortage crisis of 20? I'm actually doing really well on that because I have a limited number of creatures that eat those. I'm raising banded crickets, which uh, are really prolific. So I've got plenty of banded crickets. I got... Uh, 200 of them from Josh's frogs maybe back in I want to say maybe it was April or something and started breeding those and you can hear I'm going I've got plenty of them there I have more crickets than I know what to do with mealworms I've been breeding my own mealworms for a long time too and like I said I don't have a huge number of feeders on the mealworms I have creatures that eat them but not like hundreds or anything so I have plenty of mealworms and I also am raising superworms which is a recent thing. I started raising superworms, I don't know, when was that? A couple of months ago, maybe back in June-ish, or maybe somewhere somewhere around June. Uh, maybe it was before that. And I have lots and lots of baby superworms. So they're pretty easy to do, and they help with that. So I have plenty of all of those things, fortunately. And I probably would not have... Uh, I probably would have a bigger problem if I had lots of insectivores but I only have a like kind of a handful of insectivores so we've got a few crested geckos one leopard gecko and then we've got the like the uh, tailless whip scorpion and the Asian forest scorpion and the morning geckos and they don't really care about crickets or mealworms so much I mean I occasionally give them small crickets and I'll give my boar frogs pinhead crickets sometimes but yeah um, Isopod food recipes. Not really, because in terms of prepared foods, I just give things like Supreme Gecko Chow, Rapashi, um, Bug Burger, things like that. Um, I have occasionally given them my uh, the bug recipe, the bug jelly recipe that I use, but mostly in terms of foods, I either give them one of those prepared mixes, so I don't have to prepare it myself, or I just give them things like zucchini or apple bits or you know other types of just vegetables and things. And so the formal top hat, I will give you one more hint. It's not aquatic. And William, I don't have any tree frogs at the moment, but I have kept some. Oh, cool. That's awesome, Heather. You get to make the, the vivarium. Very cool. Um, so Austin, actually jumping spiders aren't that high maintenance, I've noticed. What I did have to figure out, though, is that they really like this spot because it's right next to this basking lamp this is a pretty low wattage one i can touch it it's not burning me it's a 25 wattage lamp so that there's a temperature gradient she loves to come bask on this side and get warm when she wants to um you got to give spray water once a week uh, twice a week about sometimes three times a week you've got to change the enclosure out clean it out about once a week and feed them about three four times a week depending on the individual and the their size and all that but it's very cool it's pretty easy um, and they really like flies, which I can go out and catch in our backyard. I don't spray the backyard, and uh, I can catch those. And she'll also eat uh, waxworm larvae, waxworm moths, 
crickets and mealworms. The, the big one, the little one's too big. She'll eat small crickets as well as small flies. Um, milk back and orange. Well, so far so good, but there's not much news yet because they're still really small, but the colony seems to be doing okay. Scolopendra polymorphy is two times a day. That's one with a good appetite. Ours was, you know, it would be good if it ate once a week. Crystal, you've got some darkling beetles too. Awesome. Okay, and thank you, Kermit. I will check that out. Whoa. Frank the Tank. Half orange and half blue body. That's interesting. Did you get some of those? So formal top hat, insects or reptiles? I prefer both. I just like them both a lot. If I had to pick one, like if we could only have invertebrates or only have reptiles, I might just pick reptiles. I don't know. I'm not sure because I like them both so much. But I like being able to interact with, like, say, a snake or a lizard on a little bit more, on a higher level than many invertebrates. Although there are some invertebrates like the jumping spider or a mantis that you can interact with on a fairly higher level. And... Uh, I do like amphibians a lot too. I always have, I've had amphibians for years. I've got dart frogs and things like that. I've had salamanders. We have an axolotl we've had for a few years. Um, oh yeah, my, another isopod uh, food that I like, in addition to flake fish food, I like the pellets. I give them the, the pellets. So Austin C, how do you catch the flies? Ooh, okay. Um, I just take a deli cup, 32 ounce deli cup outside. And uh, we have this tree where the flies will sit on the leaves and that's, it's fairly normal. Um, flies like to rest on tree leaves. So I just kind of stock up to it. I put the lid under the leaf that the fly is on. I put the, I hold the deli cup over it. And it's kind of a, you have to be careful. And you get within a critical distance about three inches or so away. And then you just thump, snap it down. And then you gently pull it off the leaf so you don't damage the leaf. You throw that fly in the freezer for about 40 seconds. And then pull it out. My freezer, 40 seconds. Your freezer might might vary from that. And then uh, you can toss it in. I learned the freezer trick from uh, Bugs in Cyberspace, by the way. Which of the animals you have experience with is the most interesting to handle? Wow. Okay. Uh, kookaburra is an interesting one to handle. Um, I, had, uh, I used to work with a kookaburra at a zoo. And they were very interesting to handle, partly because... I got to use Jesses. It was a Jess-trained kookaburra, a couple of them. They were Mickey and Foster, and they were uh, trained to uh, use Jesses. And so dealing with the Jesses was a really interesting experience. They were fun, and you could also get them to call a lot of the time. If you would make a, an initial sort of sound, they would sort of call for you a lot of the time. Really fun. So that was a very interesting experience. Also, handling parrots. Um, there was a cockatoo I worked with at the same time, Love the cockatoo. That's a very interesting experience because cockatoos are very intelligent and you have to... They try to outsmart you and they often get close to succeeding. So, very interesting there too. Um, huh, it's interesting. Your bearded dragon is very aggressive right now. Have you ever owned a Ouida? I haven't. For those of you who don't know what one is, it's a very large cricket from New Zealand. I've heard of them being sold in the U.S. I don't know how that works. Um, permit wise or anything. I've seen them for sale once or twice. I have never purchased one, but they're quite fantastic. And how many isopod morphs have you worked on? Like, probably several. Some I have failed at. Um, I was not the one who originated the orange Dalmatian Porcelio Scaber, but I did recreate it uh, with my own oranges and own Dalmatians. Uh, after Ryan Orr created the uh, Morph for the first time. I have worked on some other ones, still working on other ones. Um, like I have worked on the high yellow Armadillidium vulgare that I've, you know, I'm still working on it. It's taking a long time. Um, I tried to do the, the orange uh, dairy cows didn't work, so now I'm trying to do the orange milk bags. So probably one or two more. I've tried with uh, a pied porcelio scaber that didn't prove out very well. Same thing with um, some Dalmatian looking porcelio pruinosis that didn't prove out. So I have probably at least half a dozen. <laughs> so Newt, um, 
I think it says something about both. <laughs> so theropod hunter, yes. Orange zebras are a thing. I've seen pictures. They do exist. They're kind of hard to get a hold of. I've seen them for sale. But I'm always sold out when I've seen them, so I don't have any. But um, they do exist. Yeah, I've, I've seen pictures of the morph. They're pretty, pretty nice. You'd kind of think, uh, how, how would that look? But it looks cool, at least in my... Uh, so Jordan, how do you try and create morphs? Well, basically, you have two options. One is you find an exceptional individual that is basically a sport. Chocolate orange is possible. Yeah, I guess it might be. Um, so you try to find a sport like you notice, oh, there's a calico something. You have, say, um, some... You have Porcelio Hoffman's egg guy, and you find one that looks like a calico. And so then you isolate that, and depending on whether it's a male or female, if it's a female and it's a mature one, you'd probably just put her by herself and allow her to produce babies because likely those babies are going to be het. They're going to be hets, and you let them cross with each other, and some of those will turn out, and then you can start um, you know, taking out the, the visuals, the homozygotes, and allowing those, isolating them for the others and allow them to reproduce and then eventually back crossing them to some of the hets to get some more, you know, get a deeper gene pool going. The other option is if you know you have a species, like the orange Dalmatians, you have a species that's produced two different morphs and you know that they're the same species and you can kind of assume they're probably compatible. And so you cross them and the first thing you get is generally wild types because most of the genes with uh, isopods are recessive in most of the morphs. So you cross them, you're going to get what looks like the wild type again, but you cross those to each other because they're hets, hopefully, um, if everything is working out genetically as you surmise. And then when you cross those, about 25% of them are going to show the visual, uh, you know, the visual trait uh, that you're looking for to some extent, but not both of them. It's only, it's going to be a much smaller proportion. So 25% of those are going to show either, say, Dalmatian or orange or orange and Dalmatian but it's a very small pro proportion of them that will actually show both traits. Um, I'm going to say it's something like, is it like 12% or something? Maybe it's less than that. I don't remember exactly. But um, it is very cool to be able to do it. I, I did it. It took a couple of years to do um, the Orange Dalmatians, but I, it worked and it was fun. And now I have Orange Dalmatians that are descended from those and Orange Dalmatians that are descended from Ryan Orstock. So I, I just kind of mixed them. A complete, complete yellow caramel color would be cool. So Heather has chocolate yellow zebras as well as yellow and chocolate and super high white. Awesome. Giant Asian mantis morphs. Yeah, I've heard about that a little bit. Dairy cow morphs. Awesome. Yeah, I really am enjoying the, the dairy cow um, lavis and hope, hopefully we'll be able to produce some more interesting morphs. I've heard some interesting news about that. Uh, there's a recent video that talks about that, and then another video is coming up with more news about that. Toilet peat. They seem to stow away everywhere. So, tarantula bee. Expensive isopods. Try giving them some fish food as a food. They don't seem to eat, in my experience and what Oren says in his book, they're not a big leaf eater so much, uh, but they will eat... Uh, fish food a lot. So I've been feeding mine a lot of fish food. Seems to be working. The babies are growing really fast. Make sure, as uh, Supreme Gecko Wally says, um, put. make sure you've got concave wood structures in there, like concave pieces of cork bark or other wood so that they can be up off the substrate. Make sure they have a very dry area as well as a mossy hydration station. And I think you'll do fine with them. They seem to be one of the fastest breeding um, giant porcellias that I've ever had. So, Kermit the Hermit Crab, Aquatic Mantis, they do have those. They're not really mantids, but they, there's a creature that if you imagine an aquatic mantis, this is what you'd get. It's not a true mantis, but it looks kind of like one, often called a water scorpion. Very cool. And Frank the Tank, I wonder if that was a calico, uh, calico Porcelio Scaber, possibly. So for me, the ones that show up everywhere are the por uh, powder blues, occasionally Silisticus convexus, and it's happened with dwarf whites, but I try to take every precaution to keep the dwarf whites from not doing that. 
So out the most, newt, uh, isopods that are out the most, I would go with dairy cows or milk backs. The orange porcelli levis don't seem to be out as much. If you want one that's out a ton, that's one possibility. Go with porcelli levis, dairy cow, or milk back. They're out a ton. Um, porcelli ornatus is out a ton as well. Uh, as far as porcelio goes, those are the two picks for ones that are out a lot. And then uh, armadillidiums that are out a lot. I would say Jestroy is pretty good with that. And uh, another one is, what was the one I was going to say? Uh, let me just look over here and see. Armadillidium that's out a lot. Zebras. That's it. And so, Snailiontologist, um, to identify isopods, try bugguide.net as far as a website. And a book, Isopod Zoology by Oren McMonagall, is pretty good. It's got a lot. It doesn't have all the species, but it's got a lot of them in there and some good illustrations. Ah, so Supreme Gecko, that sounds like a good idea. Just get them all in a different room. Um, I ended up putting my Porcellione des Pruinosis on a shelf across the room from my other isopods, and I'm thinking of doing a similar thing with my dwarf whites for the same reason. Ah, I see what you're saying, Heather, yeah. The color is, is really nice. Um, on the, the scaber, it seems to be one of the brightest orange in most people's opinion. And... Uh, yeah, I guess he would probably eat those, though. That makes sense. Oh, you know what, guys? I've got to go. It's getting late. So thank you for joining in. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry that we had um, so many problems with this one. But uh, hopefully next time it'll be better. And everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and thanks.